Hello and welcome. I'm Dean Perrine, Executive Vice President at JSA, and I'll be the event host and moderator. I just have one question for you. Are you ready for fourth and goal? Because today's topic is scoring through innovation, a financially focused and forward thinking discussion that intersects the finance industry and football, and in a way that you've never seen before. So this is gonna be fun. Uh, today we welcome Mr. Mike Persico, my longtime friend and CEO and, and founder at Anova Financial Networks. We'll talk to Mike about Anova's tech, uh, Anova uh, tech, Anova's technology evolution and how innovation isn't just one play to a touchdown, but a constant path of progression. And I'm going to try not to uh, be super fan now, but on the other side of the field, we have Mr. Gary Fensick. Gary is a former Chicago Bears player, Super Bowl 20 winner, and captain of the most feared defenses in, in NFL history. Gary played 12 seasons with the Bears and was their all-time leader in interceptions and tackles. We'll talk with Gary about his professional football career career, the move into the finance industry, and the impact he's seen on innovation in business and in sport. Uh, Mike and Mr. Fensick, uh, welcome to the event. Thanks. Great. Thank you. You got it. So before we get started, I'd like to remind our audience to feel free to participate uh, with questions and comments in the chat, and we'll get to as many of those questions as we can in the allotted time. All you got to do is put that question right there in the chat, uh, and I will try to get to those um, as we move through the, uh, the discussion. All right, uh, gentlemen, let's go ahead and get started. Mike, the first question is for you. For those who might not be familiar with ANOVA, uh, can you give us a little bit of, uh, of a history, a little bit of an introduction to, uh, to ANOVA? Sure. Thanks, Dean, and welcome all attendees, and welcome, Gary. So, um, you know, when you, when you look at ANOVA, you look at our services, you look at where we connect, we, we're, we look like a carrier. And, and that's not untrue. You know, A to B, we transport data, you know, we sell services on, on, on a monthly basis, right? And, and in that vein, we're not that much different from an AT&T or a uh, Verizon, you know. But then if you peel back the layers a little bit, you know, we started out as an engineering company. And uh, so our background, our MO was always innovation. It was always coming up with the latest and greatest, not actually to disrupt the marketplace, mind you, but it was to disrupt ourselves because we knew that if we weren't an OVA 2.0 or we uh, an OVA 3.0, someone else would be. And so, you know, we would spend, you know, an inordinate amount of money on R&D time and focus and more so than other firms because that's what we believed in. And so that's why we've seen this evolution in our product set going from fiber to wireless, traditional wireless to laser. And now I find it incredibly interesting that there's been uh, a, a, a comeback to the original with hollow core fiber and you're seeing that product uh, 12 years later come back to the forefront. And so um, it's been a lot of evolution to get back to a very similar place. So, um, but a, a financial industry carrier, uh, we connect NASDAQ to NYSE, CME to ICE, uh, Japan, uh, uh, JSX to the Hong Kong exchange. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. And Gary, this next question is for you. It would absolutely be an understatement uh, to say that you know your way around the football field. But why don't you give our attendees a brief breakdown on your career playing with the Chicago Bears and then ultimately stepping off the field into the finance industry? Well, thanks a lot. And I uh, appreciate being invited, Dean. Um, you know, first of all, I went to Yale University. So there aren't any Yaleys who have uh, going there the thought of even trying to get into the National Football League. And I was very fortunate that, you know, I played 12 years. Uh, I'm from the Chicago area. I had one starting halfback the entire time I played uh, for the Chicago Bears, and that was Walter Payton. Very, very unique. And uh, I was very fortunate to be on a, a team that over time progressed and got better. 
And as you got better players and better systems and better coaches, I went through three different coaches, head coaches, that is, before we had a chance to play under Mike Ditka. And while Mike has a very unique character, I think he really, as a former player, understood how to manage a collection of athletes from a variety of different economic circumstances uh, around the country and uh, eventually lead us to the Super Bowl. Excellent. Gary, you mentioned uh, characters. Um, and obviously there's character and there are characters. Um, but you were, you were the, the captain of, of those characters in a lot of ways, uh, captain of the, of the defense there. Um, can you tell us what it was like um, to be the leader, to be the leader of those characters? Well, you know, I, I, we were talking to Mike earlier, and I, I think you'd agree that it isn't just a leadership, but leaders pick good people. And uh, I think when you really have a successful organization, and certainly the 85 Bears is a paradigm for that, it wasn't just having great coaches, but really them picking and the scouts and the general manager picking people of character. And so we didn't really need the coaches to tell us what to do. We knew what we had to do. And we knew that we had people who were capable of excelling and really making a difference and that you could trust them. I mean, trust is really important. And we used to have automatic front end coverages and, uh, and blitz coverage based on the formations. And in any NFL game, you'll see people moving around before the snap of the ball. That would change our defense uh, blitz or not. And it was just fun to be part of an intellectual and then a superior physical team. Very good. And I think carrying on with that, that theme of kind of innovation and strategy, Mike, this question is for you. ANOVA has long been a leader in, in innovation, um, but you know, that doesn't come without um, a, a significant amount of strategy and maintaining that leadership position within in, um, innovation. So maybe tell, talk to us a little bit about um, your, your innovation path and um, you know, what that progression has been like for ANOVA. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a prerequisite, though, if you think about it in, in the industry that we're in. And like I said earlier, if you don't do it yourself, uh, a competitor will or the customers will. You know, they're, they have very bright people um, and they are willing to make investments in their technology and their infrastructure as much as you are. And so, you know, sometimes people say to me, they're like, isn't it exhausting that you have to rebuild your networks every 18 months? Isn't it, um, you know, wouldn't it just be nice to make a capital investment every decade and then, you know, sit back and, and, and get a return off of that? Well, it would, except that's not possible in this space. But so, and I don't view it as exhausting. I view it as exhilarating. I mean, we bring products to market that are so ahead of their time, no other industry would use them. And, and I'm talking about not just the Nova, but the FinTech, uh, you know, exchange to exchange connectivity in general. And so I think that we take these things sometimes out of the military, sometimes they're science faction, you know, and we're making them a reality collectively and we're refining them. And then we find that they get used in other industries because they've matured under us. And when I mentioned hollow core fiber earlier, that's exactly what, what will happen. You know, there's been an adoption uh, and an implementation by uh, firms like myself and some of uh, uh, the other individual uh, trading companies, but no one else is going to, no one else is using it right now. But fast forward three to five years and you'll see it uh, be quite pervasive in its use by traditional carriers, other industries, that need low latency, high capacity fiber. And so you have to be committed to it and you really need to enjoy it. You can't have it be a burden, right? You know, and, 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 and we do. I think that's what makes our job so interesting in working with these technologies, bringing them to market. And you know what, sometimes, you know, failing with them a few times before you get them to work. You know, Mike, you mentioned the word committed, 
And um, and just to 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 kick this, uh, the, you know, with that word in mind, to kick the next question over to Gary. So Gary, you playing on the uh, iconic uh, Chicago Bears defense, known for one of the most innovative schemes, um, the four six. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience moving to the 4-6 defense and, and what it meant to, to the Bears and ultimately your ability to dominate in the league? I got to believe there was a commitment to that scheme to get the job done. Well, I mean, I think you know, innovators you know, have an early advantage, but there are a lot of copycats that follow, but you still need people who can execute. I mean, it's great to have a technology, but you got to have people who can really execute in that. And for us, the first time we ever played the 46 defense, it was Neil Armstrong's last year before Mike Ditka became head coach. We played the San Diego Chargers with Dan Fouts, and we beat the heck out of those guys with this defense that, you know, really confused a lot of people, made quarterbacks, make quick decisions. And, uh, you know, but it was only one element of that overall defense. And, uh, you know, over time, you know, there were a lot of copycats and, and then offenses, you know, change too. And I would say today it would be very difficult to run the 46 because people run three or four wide receivers and they start to isolate you. So, uh, you know, things change. But as Mike was saying, you have to constantly innovate. Otherwise, you know, you will fall behind. You know, I'm very fortunate that for the last 20 years, I've been a partner in a private equity firm based out of Chicago, but we have 10 offices worldwide. So, we're always looking for either disruptive companies or we have a fund of funds product and we're with, I would say, the best venture managers in the US, Europe, and particularly in China today. And it's amazing. I mean, you know, you have these product innovations, but then you get a little bit bigger and then you need to scale, you know? So it's always product market fit and that's always changing. You know, Gary, was everybody committed day one to the 4-6, or were there people that went uh, over unwillingly? You know, I, I, I think most of us weren't quite sure what the hell we were doing, <laughs> right? right? Are we really going to do this? And you ended up blitzing a little bit more. But, you know, it also a, any type of unique offense or defense, it starts with, uh, you know, a great scheme, but it also you want to be consistent, and you have to have – you're really great if you have great players. I mean, we all watch the Super Bowl. Hey, Tom Brady is a pretty phenomenal player, but right. they had a lot of great players. And, you know, all of a sudden you're saying, wow, there's a lot of guys on this defense at Tampa Bay that seem to be pretty good, you know, right? right. And we don't really know who they are. But, you know, I think it's a combination of both. Yeah, you know, and I, it's, it's commitment, yes, and, but it's also vision. You know, you can't have innovation without vision. And I think that's a little bit of what you were talking about, Dean, with your earlier question. And, you know, when you're going to do something that's novel or innovative, the vision is going to be questioned. And, you know, I'll give you an analog to that. You know, we were going to deploy millimeter wave technology, which is now the de facto standard for Metro wireless networks. Except we were going to do it in a way where instead of going three miles, we would go 15 and, you know, we would set, so the hops would be longer, so we wouldn't have five millions of, avail of availability, but we'd have 95%. But there were people that said everything from it'll never work, including people within my own company, by the way, you know, there were uh, contractors that refused to build the network because they said, you know what, we're going to save you uh, from even having to spend this money. You know, what you're, go what you're doing is, is not feasible. And, and so, but you have to fight through that and you have to say, no, I believe in the vision and, you know, I'll be the one, I'll raise my hand if it doesn't work, but I think it will. So, you know, there's vision and then there's the commitment to it. And I think Buddy had a vision too, yeah. and he was committed to it. But, but, you know, look at, you know, today technology. I mean, you know, Andreessen said that, uh, you know, technology is going to eat the world and look at, I mean, now it's in cars, it's in all of these areas that you never really thought about in your plan, but the applicability of that uh, is much wider than you realize. I mean, you know, we just look at, you know, look at the millennials, the, the, the changing food habits. And, you know, I, I, I just look at all the different applications that we see entrepreneurs and, and venture funds present to us. It just, uh, it's amazing. It's really exciting. Yeah. to be able to see just how dramatic that impact is having on a population globally. Yeah, there's no shortage of ideas and no shortage of innovation. Yeah. 
Yeah, you, you guys are, particularly in the U.S., though, right? That you have the. Yeah, you, you can sign off now, Dean. Yeah. I was say, you, <laughs> if, if I'm not needed, I can just leave. <laughs> Now uh, you guys are you guys are really providing all of the uh, all of the the, the great uh, segues that I could ever ask for. But just to, to keep us to keep us on on target, so um, you know, um, Gary, you were talking about copycats. We're talking about commitment and copycats and innovation. There's somebody out there who wants to steal your lunch every every around every turn. So Mike, back over to you. You know, with knowing that, knowing that there are copycats out there, you know, how do you go about? making that turn before the copycat does? How do you continuously stay in your lane of differentiation um, to, to make sure that no one's coming after your lunch? Yeah, you know, people talk about first mover advantage and that exists in innovation as well. Because if you can bring a product to market that's novel and uh, first of its kind and get adoption, well, look, that won't exist in a vacuum. There will be other people that will reverse engineer that, that will figure out how it's done and that will offer a similar service. But if you are constantly innovating, they'll be busy deploying your technology or your innovation from two years ago. So you're already well on your way to the next item. And so if you stop, then that's when the problem happens. So the best way to deal with a copycat is to always move forward. And if you've had the first mover advantage, you keep that. And so there's this concept of kind of perpetual motion, perpetual innovation, you know, that you have to engage in. And, you know, people talk about the race to zero in our industry, right? And that, you know, that ends with the, when you have transactions, uh, networks that are occurring at the speed of light. And, you know, I kind of question that. I say it ends when we lose the ability to measure time, right? You know, but that's a glib answer. In reality, the, the race to zero isn't just NASDAQ to, to NYSE. You know, there's a global economic fabric that can be optimized for, um, from Shanghai to the CME. You know, and it can, and it's not just networks. It's FPGA. It's uh, a back. It's risk management. It's algorithms. It's all all of this execution stack that's wound together. You know, and so there's, as I said earlier, there's no, there's no shortage of ideas or, or innovations, and you have to. Yes, you stay in your lane, but you also have to understand when you when you need to pivot. And some of our best innovations have been products that I'll call to be adjunct to our core service, like self-healing, where you, a wireless network is going to have some loss. You know, um, on a cell phone network, we lose a bar, half a bar. It doesn't matter. On a financial network, you're losing trades. You're losing market data. That's critical. Those are gaps, right? And so we developed a product that if you dropped a packet, a single packet, over wireless, the entire wireless feeds pauses and it's backfilled by the fiber network. So nobody loses a trade, nobody loses a single price, you know, and, and that was an innovation at its time. And, and, and now it's part uh, of the, uh, the fundamental products that we offer. Hey, Mike, can I ask you, is, it, is that uh, part of the process of scaling that as you scale, you, you start to see these, either additional opportunities or things that will make you more competitive in an iterative way? You know, it's, it's a little bit of scale because you kind of have the breadth of personnel uh, and, and, and experience to, to, to identify opportunities. But it's also about the evolution of the product set. When you were just, uh, when people were trading and, and getting market data over fiber, you didn't need a product like this. But as things evolved to the primary method of connecting to the exchanges being over wireless, then a product had to be developed to account for the, law, the, the data losses, you know. And so, you know, there's no perfect technology. So as you implement one thing, uh, perhaps on the basis of latency, you then need a product to pair with that to uh, address uh, availability, right? And we're working on the perfect product. It just, it, it, it's not there yet. 
You know, um, just as a, as a segue to our next question, you know, it does, it, you know, I, I feel like there's some themes that are obviously boiling out of the conversation that we have right now, innovation and commitment and teamwork and moving parts and, and you, know, st- you know, strategy and things like that. Um, but all of those things combined sometimes don't equal the same number at the end. So, so Gary, this question really is for you. You know, the four, six scheme, um, you, 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 you perfected it and perfected it in a way that made others that were running it still not as good as the bears. Why is that? Was it talent? Was it commitment? Was it? I, I, was I think it? it's, you know, one, the, uh, the level of trust, you know, you'd be surprised in football, uh, most defensive coordinators say, run this play. Doesn't matter what offense you're facing. Doesn't matter if you have four wide receivers or they switch or they're predictable in doing something. And Buddy Ryan would trust his players. And so we could audible. And, uh, and as I was mentioned before, a lot of times we didn't know what the defensive front or coverage was until they finally got into the formation. You know, they'd have a guy go in motion. We might change. And so we felt that we were smarter than the offensive schemes that we faced because we had that flexibility. But that meant that not only did you have to be physically uh, good, you had to be mentally good. And Buddy, more than anything else, hated mental errors. Mm. And so if you didn't have the brains to make those adjustments, you're probably going to watch the game from the sidelines. So, I, you know, to me, it isn't just, you know, being good – as one would think, oh yeah, he's bigger, faster, stronger, whatever. It was that combination. And, uh, and then once you feel that, you know it as a player and as a unit that you're kind of a step, you're just doing something different. And you can see on film that people are trying to mimic you, but you, you would almost laugh, oh, they're not exactly, they, they have the framework, but they really don't know what they're doing, you know? And, uh, and that's when it became really fun. And of course, for me, I played free safety during the uh, the great teams, and so I would have a total view of, you know, before the snap of the ball going, you know what, they are not going to be able to stop Richard Dent or we're blitzing and they're not going to be able to protect it. And uh, it was kind of a joy to watch. I mean, I didn't play the entire fourth quarter of the Super Bowl because we were so far ahead. You know, uh, I want to uh... – go uh, stay on the football tangent for real uh, for a quick second here. So you brought up the concept of defensive audibles. You know, everybody's incredibly familiar with uh, Peyton Manning changing a play or Tom Brady changing a play at the line and and the better quarterbacks have that latitude. But how prevalent is a defensive audible? How many defensive coordinators allow it? To me, this is almost the first time I've ever heard of, of it. And I've been a football fan my whole life. You'd be surprised. Not a lot. They don't trust their players. And that was why Buddy, who was a corporal in the Army in Korea, Mm -hmm. you know, he was tough. But once you earned his respect, uh, you know, and you were mentally and physically good, then he trusted you. And, you know, I would go after every TV timeout, and there are a lot of them. I would go to the sideline, of course. I would hear, oh, run this blitz, uh, run this stunt. Mm -hmm. And Buddy, you know, would say, who the hell is running this defense? But he would listen (laughs) And I think that that's why everybody loved playing for him or probably loved playing for his sons. But most defensive coordinators do not because there's a lot going on in there. They, in their own mind, have already kind of played this out like a war game. And uh, the input from the players, they just don't seem to think it's as it's, uh, it's critical as I think Buddy did. Who did Buddy who did Buddy trust to make some of those defensive audibles? And my, my thought was always that it was Mike Singletary. Well, those audibles, they, they weren't necessarily audibles. I mean, they were automatic. I mean, you had to know. We had the game plan that if they were in a split backfield or an eye backfield, guy goes in motion, everybody knew. But the people who would communicate that, because, you know, you've got 80,000 people screaming and yelling, so you'd have to use a lot of times even hand signals because you couldn't hear, uh, would be me in the secondary because I'm in the middle of the field. Uh, Singletary, and then it would probably be Hampton and, and McMichael. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, and, and again, you think that all oh, physical errors, those are really apparent and you can see those. But boy, if you make a mental error, it would be brutal the next day in the film room. Because, you know, you're getting, you know, it, it, it's either you're good enough or you're not. 
But instead of just looking at your physical capabilities, it's your mental ones. I think this is why I think AI today, it is, it is imbued in baseball, but it's not yet there in football, but it's getting there. I listen to Moneyball and Wharton Business on Sirius. I just love when they get into all this stuff that you don't really think about, but is applicable if you get enough you know, points uh, uh, to really be able to say th these are trends. You know, sometimes I, I you know, you, you made the connection with AI and I just remember as being like a 12 or 13 year old boy watching you run around. You were just seemingly everywhere, almost as if you had some kind of artificial intelligence saying, I'm going to, you know, predicting where it is that you needed to be before you actually need to be there. Um, so pretty fascinating stuff. But anyway, to get us back on uh, target really quickly here, guys, because um, maybe we should have booked four hours for this one today, I think. Um, but uh, Mike, the next question is for you. You know, what do you want Anova to be known for as far as being a step ahead of the rest? Is it is it is being a step ahead of the rest enough or is 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 there something more there? You know, I I don't think about it as much in, in those terms, right? You know, something to be known for. It's, it's having a strategy, having a vision, executing on it, being committed to that. And, and I think the rest kind of takes care of itself, right? Um, you know, I do think that there are, uh, there are kind of tiers of companies where, you know, some are very traditional uh, carriers, and they uh, stay in a, in a in a classic lane. Um, and then there's a small select group of people who will uh, build uh, cutting edge networks, who will take chances, and 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 and, and we're in that group, and we're and we're comfortable with that, right? Um, you know, it's 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 been 12 years, right? And and you know. Sometimes we, we go through a pattern of design, deploy, sell, right? You know, and so you, you always, you're not always designing, right? Because there's a cycle uh, to that, to, to de design and then deploy and then sell. Those are, that's a three to five year period, right? So it's cyclical in, in that regard. So every three to five years is when we're actually, you know, bringing something new to market, but we're not full time innovating because you do need to block and tackle to use the football analogy, you know, and do the operational things of deploying and selling. Design, uh, design in a vacuum uh, isn't good enough. You know, we're not an R&D uh, 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 <laughs> facility at a university. Very good, Mike. I think I think now is probably a good time to maybe take a couple of audience questions. We do have one from Mr. Tim Braun. Thank you for your question, Tim. First, he says, uh, thanks for joining us, Gary. I, I echo that. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, by the mid 80s, you were established, you, you were an established top level NFL player. What made you have the foresight and desire to continue your education at Northwestern in the middle of your football career? Great question. Yeah, sure is. And, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to have not one, but two mentors, uh, you know, in my 20s and 30s. And uh, one of them had been a Harvard Business School grad, a Fortune 500 uh, a CEO. And he said, you know, you could go to uh, Kellogg or you go to you know, Booth or University of Chicago at the time uh, part time. And I go, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do that when I get done with football. And so unfortunately, uh, one year I went into the season knowing that I had to, my, my ankle had some problems. And they said, you know, you probably tore them and we're going to have to wait till after the season, but you can get through the season. Then opening day against the Green Bay Packers, I broke my arm on the artificial turf field. Mm -hmm. and missed two games, and then we made the playoffs against the Philadelphia Eagles, and on a failed safety blitz, uh, I tore a ligament on my knee, all on the left side, and that's when uh, I worked out, you know, seven days a week for six months, made all pro, and then I started Kellogg uh, two nights a week during the football season, and then full time. So it was purely based on, I thought, I was going to get back out of football onto the traditional path of a Yaley. And uh, it was one of the best things I ever did. I really enjoyed it. I was single. So it wasn't like I had to worry about kids or a wife or anything. But I was also an English history major. And so 
to take stats and accounting and finance at first was pretty difficult, but you know, it really worked out well. And my last class was in the fall of 1985. <laughs> 85 just keeps on coming back for me. You know, um, so we've talked, we're talking a little bit about some adversity, you know, and, and, and things like that, but um, let's, let's move away from that. <laughs> Why don't you tell us what you're in this? I feel like this is a question you can go on, on about all afternoon. Um, but what was your favorite NFL moment? You know, no, I, again, I had mentioned earlier, I'm from Chicago. So, you know, no one had won anything in Chicago for so long. And we, uh, the most memorable has to be the Super Bowl, without question. It changes your life. But really, the best memory is the NFC Championship game against the Rams at Soldier Field. At the end of the game, Wilbur Marshall picked up a fumble and ran about 50 yards. I knew as I was chasing him down the field, first of all, it started to snow. And then we knew as he ran into the end zone we were going to the Super Bowl. It was not just a great moment for us as players, but the whole crowd. You knew there was no way that we weren't going to the Super Bowl. It was a it was a wonderful wonderful time. You know that is ingrained in every Bears fan memory. You know, <laughs> I, I, I we, we know the play that you're talking about. You know, and and, he and spun NFL around, film. You know, it was just it, it it really was like out of a movie. Yeah, right. Players. Well, in that NFL Films, you know, memorialized yeah. as well. You know, uh, I forget the name of that announcer. He was so amazing. John Facenda. Yes. He was always the best. Yeah. Um, okay, we have uh, one last of our regularly scheduled questions, and then we're going to jump into some more audience uh, uh, attendee questions. Mike, this is for you. 2021 is off to a really fast start. After 2020, Thank the Lord, right? Um, it's after, up to a very, very fast start for you. Um, what can our viewers expect to see from Innova in 2021? Yeah, you know, we're, as most people know, we have our own wireless platform. So we've made the investments to own our own technology. And, you know, we think that being uh, kind of subservient to off-the-shelf products or third-party uh, uh, products, what that ends up uh, not allowing you to do is uh, respond to the marketplace quickly or have custom features uh, built in, um, you know, because it may not be in the best interest to the third party to, to do what you or your constituents need in terms of to stay competitive. And so we realized that uh, a long time ago. And so we're a little bit atypical uh, versus a, a standard carrier in as much as that we make uh, investments in owning our own technology, our own assets, our own platforms, right? Um, and uh, over the past three years, we've been developing a 10 gigabit per second wireless backbone. And so... Um, we're about to roll that out across the entire uh, New Jersey uh, metropolitan area. It's called the Equity Triangle. It connects BATS to NYSE to NASDAQ. And so, you know, we're really excited about it because it gives extra capacity. Um, it's very low latency and it's the next evolution in, in who we are. And, um, you know, we think that the sky's the limit from there. But again, you know, we're out of the design stage. We've designed it. Now we're deploying it. And in short order, it'll sort of be ready uh, to be marketed. And so this year, 2021, is the year of the 10 gig network. Very good. Uh, congratulations, uh, Mike. We will definitely be uh, monitoring uh, your progress over 2021. Uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, for bringing this all together today. But now let's uh, now let's really kick the fun up a notch, shall we? Okay. Uh, I do have questions from the audience. Gary, um, how has the game changed since you retired? Well, clearly the biggest change is that. Uh, Nobody could touch the quarterback anymore. <laughs> Boy, I would hate to be a defensive player today. But, you know, I think just in terms of, you know, the passing games, the critical part now, uh, unfortunately, 
Uh, the Bears never seem to get that puzzle of getting the quarterback who can really excel in the NFL. But, you know, when I was playing more of a balance between run and pass, and you'd have two wide receivers and a tight end until maybe third down. Today, really, I think the normal offense is three, if not four wide receivers. And so that really changes the composition of the defense as well. You have more probably a nickel uh, defense, five defensive backs or more. They call it a dime, a six. And, uh, and so I, that has made a significant change in terms of the skill set and really the body types that, uh, that you see in the NFL. Um, I have a question for you. So um, given, given kind of the um, overall uh, pandemic environment and, and what it kind of meant for um, getting, getting to games and, and things like that, do you think that that's going to have a lasting effect on football fandom or you think it's just a blip? Well, I'm a season ticket holder, so I sure as heck hope that I'm going to be able to watch the Bears in the stadium next year. But I do think that, you know, whether it's Zoom technology or, or just how people are watching the game of football and the analytics, and now you're getting, you know, more and more gambling involved for, that you can do from your, uh, your TV. I think that the challenge for the NFL is whether people value going to a live experience or do you stay home and not pay $10 for a beer, $50 for parking, $200 for tickets, is it worth it? And that's, you know, uh, that's going to be a bit of a challenge. But in terms of football itself, I know that, you know, they're doing everything they can to prevent concussions. But concussions with as big and as fast as people are, it's going to be really hard to, uh, you know, just stop that. Uh, but I, you know, I think that for me, the football experience has changed. And analytics, even on TV, are getting more and more involved in that. So that there are, I think, different ways to appreciate the game of football. But still, those athletes and the ability to throw a pass and to catch a pass and to tackle someone is is truly a, you know, you get out there. And in college, you might be one of four good players on the team. In the pros, everybody's good. And no one is protecting. I'm not trying to protect the guy because he's not as good next to me. If I do that, I won't be in the NFL very long. And you just see some phenomenal physical talent. And, you know, I think, you know, even the quarterbacks, you look at this and go, you've got six people, four people coming in, you know, thousands of pounds of muscle have come in your way, and you're able to somehow throw this fear 50 or 60 yards in a perfect pass. It's a magic. You know, the league wanted this trend. They wanted more points on the board. They wanted the star quarterbacks to not get hurt and be out for 12 games out of a 16-game season. And so they put in uh, the tighter pass interference. They put in you can't hit the quarterback. And so the, the game has changed over time, you know, and they changed because the NFL wanted a different product. And um, so to that end, and perhaps you're biased, which product do you prefer, Gary? Do you prefer your brand, you know, when you played? Or do you like seeing uh, 42 to uh, 30 uh, games, yeah. you know? And, and, and I, I kind of have my own uh, opinion, but I, I'd like to hear what you have to say. You know, I, I think that um, it's, more of a, it's more of a chess game today than it even was back when I was playing. I mean, you know, you've got to make adjustments on, okay, how are they going to attack? you know, defensive, uh, you know, if you have five or six and, uh, you know, they're still running the ball and then you get a guy who's running like a four, two, he's like an Olympic athlete who's coming through as a running back or, you know, like that guy, Henry on Tennessee who weighs 240 pounds. I mean, you know, I only got one concussion, you know, this is in the old days where, you one know, I, concussion. Where I, I had to go <laughs> off the field, you know, right. I hit Earl Campbell. Well, I had a 33 inch waist and Earl Campbell had a 34 inch thigh. So it didn't take very long to figure out, you know, and he wasn't really looking to make moves. He was just going to run right over you. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, the game's changed, but you know, the game's changed in baseball and, you know, all of these games. I mean, basketball mm -hmm. didn't even have when Michael Jordan was around. You're like, can you imagine if he his whole career had a three-point lane, uh, three-point shooting? Um, and I think it is, as you said, it's to get more action, more points, 
And, you know, in football, where you have a salary cap, although it's going down this year, but it was $200 million, and you're now paying one player 30 to $40 million a year, mm, yeah. you, better, you better make sure that that guy is going to be around. So I, I understand the protection. You know, the one thing as a defensive player, each set of referees kind of call a game slightly different. And you know within 10 plays how they're going to call – are they going to call holding? Are you going to be able to get away with a little bit more in the secondary? Uh, everybody screams and yells at the refs the, the entire game. You just have a mouth guard on, so they probably can't understand what you're saying. But, uh, you know, it's just those adjustments. Uh, but I do think that, you know, in any sport, you do want to be able to accentuate great athletic ability and skill sets uh, for the benefit of, of the viewers, mm-hmm. the fans. Mike, I, I debated asking this question at all because I feel like uh, there can only really be one answer on, on this <laughs> during this discussion. But um, do you have a favorite football team? Come on. I think, I think it's evident. You know, I grew up a, a Bears fan, even in the face of my stepfather being from Green Bay, and he was a diehard Packers fan. I mean, he tried to indoctrinate me and bring me to Lambeau Field and make me sit on one of the, in, in a, basically the coldest place on earth. Yeah, on earth. <laughs> it is Lambeau Field because the wind r- rips right through that, that barn. And it was the old Lambeau, not the new one, right? So you're sitting on bench seats. And it was, I had to get up and leave the game. I mean, I was 10, right? You know, and, and, and it was so cold, but I managed to resist that. You know, and came out of it on the right side, still their <laughs> fan to this day. Well, Mike, they, they still have those bench seats. You know, the, the Green Bay Lambeau is the only stadium in the NFL that doesn't have seats on the back. It's lit like you went to a high school game. And I asked Mark Murphy, who is a friend of mine who's the uh, president of the Packers, played for the Washington Redskins, said, you, you ever think about getting rid of those seats? And uh-huh. he goes, no, no, you'd have to re- – you, you would – if you put normal seats in, like every other stadium has, you'd lose about thirty. Yeah, they lose about capacity. Third of your seats. He goes, mm-hmm. "I'm not that dumb. That's never going to happen." Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they don't seem to mind, right? You're uh, like, I don't. I well, can so cold up there. You're you're huddling up with everybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is better for body warmth. Yeah, yeah, right. That's, I'm, uh, I'm not yeah. snuggling with it. That's how smart those guys are. But you yeah. know. <laughs> Gary, is there is there a place you hated to play? You know, I can't say that I hated to play. Although, you know, it, early in the 70s, when it, they used to be able to throw real beer cans onto the field. And you would hear it. I mean, you're like, don't take your helmet off on the sideline. It <laughs> would happen in Detroit. I mean, a full, you know, Stroh's beer or something like that. Is, it makes a little explosion on the field. So I would say that, uh, you know, we, we played, again, talk about transitions. Well, when I first started, there weren't heaters on the sideline. Most people don't realize the white benches uh, that all the teams have have jet heaters being blown underneath there. So it's so warm, you can barely stand there. And, uh, you know, I played early in my career where up in Minnesota. We were outside, and both teams are on the same sideline. And we were like, oh, it's a really cold game. We were like, oh, at least we'll have heaters. Well, another new rule I did, wasn't aware of. If the home team doesn't use the heaters, you don't get them either. And they, I think they just psych teams out. Can you imagine being the Miami Dolphins They're coming up to, you know, Green mm-hmm. Bay or to Minnesota? Like, what? No heat? I mean, it's, it just psychs you out. And as much as people think that, oh, it's, it's brutal, and it is tough if you're, a, you know, an L.A. team or something like that, and you're coming up to a Green Bay or Minnesota or Pittsburgh or something like that, it is equally brutal to go, you know, from Chicago to play Miami in December when you're just not used to that heat and you melt. I mean, it, it, you better hope that you don't have long drives against you because you'll see guys literally kneeling in the, in the huddle because it, it just snaps you. Yeah. Is, it, is it more difficult to play in the heat than it is in the, in the bitter cold? I, I think so, because I think, you know, in the bitter cold, it's only bitter, in, you know, for one or one series, and then you go to the sideline. If it's really hot, there, there weren't, you know, they, now I see on the sideline, they, it looks like they have, you know, coolers and, you know, all that. They didn't have any of that when I was playing. It was just, hey, I mean, it was so cold in Green Bay one year. I was 
talking to somebody, I had my arm, I was trying to heat it up and next to a heater and I looked and I burned all the hair off my arm. I didn't even realize it. I was like the scarecrow in the Wizard of Oz. Like, oh, I'm on fire. <laughs> but at least I was getting warm. So um, Gary, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, the camaraderie of those of those eighty five uh, bears. Did you have did you have a circle? Uh, you know the buddies were there with with the defense and the offense. Did you have uh, friends on the on the team? Do you keep in touch? With them? <laughs> yeah, I knew some of the offensive guys. Not, no, no, I'm just kidding. I, I you know I think a lot of it. The, the big difference between being in the pros and being in college or high school is that there's only a two year gap, three year gap at most between a freshman and a, and a senior. But, you know, when I played in the Super Bowl, Walter and I were the two oldest guys on the team starters. And so we were 31. Well, you know, think about that. I'm 10 years older than a guy coming out of college, you know, mm. Kevin Butler, who was a rookie. And so you have this gap. I mean, you know, you, you come out and you're like, holy smokes, that guy's got a wife and two kids, you know, and you're, <laughs> you don't see that. So, that then also, I was one of the few guys who lived uh, downtown Chicago. And uh, so, you know, everybody would come downtown. But, uh, you know, I think that you kind of segregate uh, teams, you know, a little bit by age, but also are they married, unmarried? Um, but, you know, to this day, you're foolish if you play for the Chicago Bears and you had a good career to not live in Chicago. No. Wow. It's, it's been great. And I, you know, today it's gone, it's full time. You, you don't have any off season. We would work off season jobs. You had the ability to do that. And I tell guys, uh, and most of them actually don't listen to me, but for the few guys that I do advise, I'll say, you know, if you work as hard as you did to become an NFL player with humility and you just sacrifice everything and you use that same attitude in any business that you want to do in Chicago, people will want to help you. Mm -hmm. like, you know, but there are a lot of them who had a great career. Maybe they're 30 years old. They've never had an off season. They don't know what they want to do. And you say, well, you know, you're going to have to start here. And they'll go, oh, that's, that's, I, I wouldn't, that's below me. And they're like, you, you, you didn't graduate. I mean, you know, maybe you didn't even graduate from college. So, you know, it, it's unfortunate, but you know, some people are coddled for a real long time and, uh, you know, they came from uh, not much, but they've kind of lost a little bit of that. Mike, you know, I hear you agreeing. I'm assuming that there's something analogous kind of in the world that you, uh, that you operate in too, huh? Well, no. Uh, I, was, um, I was actually thinking of the ESPN 30 on 30 um, uh, special where they showed the letter that you guys wrote to yeah. save Buddy's job, and you wrote it to, to Mr. Hallis, and he wrote me a letter back. And wow. and I got to tell you, like people, when they were interviewing people from the defense, they were like crying. I was watching it, you know, and I was uh, getting misty. Like that was the most amazing thing. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. What prompted you guys to do it? Whose idea was it? And I can't believe it was successful. You know what I mean? Like uh, normally management is like, yeah, that's great. You know, but you work here. We're making a decision. Thanks for your input. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, that's what I thought before I wrote the letter too. <laughs> but well, it really, I give Alan Page, he, he, you know, he was a hall of fame player. He spent his last couple of years with Minnesota. So he knew Buddy Ryan when he was a defensive line coach in Minnesota. And we knew our coaches were going to get probably terminated and uh, he said, you know, you've got to do something. I was an all-pro safety, so you, you're safe a little bit because you're, you're at least a, a good player. Mm -hmm. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, you could write a letter. And I go, to who? And he goes, to the owner. And you know, this is just as stupid now as it was back yeah. then. I go, you got to be kidding me. So I wrote the letter and uh, covered my butt and had all the, starter, all the defense sign it. Sure, and exactly. Sent it, yeah, and sent it to George Hallis. And lo and behold, we didn't have a really good in, we didn't have an indoor facility. So we would sometimes practice at the Great Lakes Naval Training Center, which has cement floors. So if you had any knee problems, it would just kill you. And George Hallis showed up and he had never Amazing. been to a practice. And he had a black fedora on and he, uh, right. and he needed some assistance with uh, his driver. But we had already broken up offensively and defensively, and everybody's like, what the hell is going on? You're like, are you kidding me? It's the letter. And he told our coaches, I'll never forget this, Mike, to take a hike. Take a hike. 
Sure. And, uh, <laughs> and he said, I got your letter. I had never gotten a letter like this. And then, you know, he was in his 80s and he pointed, and he goes, your coaches will be back next year. Oh, and then, that's you know, amazing. Goes, well, so the offensive guys are going, hey, what was that all about? That George House was here. Uh, it looks like uh, we got, you know, uh, we're, we think our coaches are going to be safe. So, <laughs> so, buddy, you know, Neil Armstrong, the head coach, gets fired. George Hallis uh, hires Buddy Ryan or rehires him. Mm-hmm. And then Ditka inherits Buddy Ryan. So it leads that, you know, great mm-hmm. dynamic tension. But, you know, it, it's funny you bring it up because – some people have said, you know, did you really write that letter? And you know, I was like, mm, I did my garage a couple of years ago and, and I had to get all the boxes out cause they're going to put the, you know, that acrylic floor down. Yeah. And I go, What's in this box? You know, there's some tax stuff. And I see this folder that says the bears mm-hmm. and I look and I forgot George Hallis wrote me a letter back. Wow. He goes, I've never gotten a letter like this. You, you know, I can assure you. He didn't say, our coaches would be back, but he came and physically did that. And he didn't like, have to wow. do that, but he no, did. So you know, like that's the type of stand-up so, guy he was. So now the Bears collect everything. So I, you know, I, I scan and send this to him because I go, I don't know if you ever got your grandfather's letter to me. Wow. And, and Pat McCaskey was kind of the historian. Mm-hmm. He goes, oh, hey, thanks a lot. You know, we didn't have that letter. He goes, by the way, your letter, you uh, typed in 1981, your letter had a typo on it. Uh-huh. You misspelled morale. Wow. And uh, you know, I was like, oh, great. So I wrote back to him. I said, oh, thanks a lot for the letter. By the way, Microsoft didn't go public until 85. Mm-hmm. They didn't have a laptop until, what, 83, 82. And I wasn't able to use spell check. Right, but, right. You know, thanks for bringing out the uh, the air. Like, Last time I'm sending you a letter from your exactly grandfather. Right, yeah, <laughs> right. Oh God, that was funny. Well, but you, you know, know and that's interesting because that wasn't in the thirty on thirty. Hell's yeah. response was it wasn't in. Well, there. let me tell you. So I was a pallbearer for Buddy. I was very close to him. Hamp and I, uh, Dan Hampton, and I saw Buddy. You know, a couple of weeks before he passed away. So they. Nobody wanted to do that 30-30 because they thought it was going to be, oh, everybody's, you know, it, it's a downer. And they go, no, 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 it's, uh, we really, you guys are iconic. Mm-hmm. And so we do it. And uh, at the end of that, you mentioned, Mike, I was crying. Everybody was crying. Yeah. And they called me up and said they had already done the interview. And a couple of, you know, like a couple months later, they go, hey, you know, we're doing the final editing. Would you mind coming to Ditka's restaurant? Because mm-hmm. uh, Buddy wrote back a letter to you guys. I was like, you did? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I go over there and, you know, they said, hey, uh, just take a read of this. And, you know, when you're ready. Well, this letter was so oh, emotional. And uh, his last words to us, I, I, I was the only guy that he told that he was taking the Philadelphia job before the Super Bowl because he knew as an older player, I could, you know, I wasn't going to tell anybody. And uh, his last words to us that night before the Super Bowl, after, you know, we were about to have milk and cookies or something like that. He goes, we're going to win this game. But he goes, no matter what, you guys always be my heroes. He gets emotional and he walks out. And everybody's like, whoa, what, what's going on? And I was like, well, I knew he was, he was leaving. Right, right. And so um, they, that letter that they wanted me to read, they said, oh, uh, you know, and, and he came back to, hey, I love you guys. You'll always be my heroes. Wow. Oof. Yeah. Craziness gives you chill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm going to need to move on from this, you guys. <laughs> uh, we do have. Come on, let's get back to the network. <laughs> yeah. We do have a couple more questions. Uh, we really, uh, guys, I, I do. I, I really feel like I, we could talk forever, but we've only got five minutes left. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into a couple more questions from the attendees, and then we will kind of wrap things up and uh, and get on with things. So uh, next question, who was more intimidating, Reggie White or um, LT? Ooh, you know, I, I kind of think LT. I mean, he was, you know, they both were uh, clearly Hall of Fame, but LT had a mean streak to him that, uh, and he was a phenomenal athlete. Yeah. Um, new soldier field versus old soldier field. Would you like the new design? Uh, I, you know, I, I'm the not spaceship? crazy about the new one, but, but I, 
You know what? The old one was really, you know, it was built in the 1920s. Matter of fact, our, my first year, the last game was against Green Bay. We weren't, they weren't going anywhere. Either were we. We go into the bathroom. Oh, bad news. We're there for about five or six hours. Uh, three of the five toilets are frozen. Found out after the game, all the toilets had froze for the Green Bay Packers. And you go, this is the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Best running back you played with against that wasn't named Peyton. Yeah. You know, I'd have to say out of respect, Earl Campbell. I mean, I knew who the hammer and who the nail was. But, you know, there were really a lot of good ones. Billy Sims with Detroit. He had a short career, a great one. Tony Dorsett. You know, then you get into quarterbacks. I mean, Montana. Elway, Marino, God, I mean, yeah. phenomenal talent. Was Barry Sanders in the league before? No, thank he God he wasn't, Mike. Yeah. They actually, he went, He came in the year after, and the Bears played on a Thursday night uh, on Thanksgiving, and right before half, about eight tackles, missed tackles, including Mike Singletary, who I think might have missed him twice. I called up Mike after the game, and I said, hey, are you okay? Yeah, congratulations, guys won the game. Are you okay? And he goes, what do you mean? I go, well, I, I wasn't sure if you broke your ankles on the first missed tackle or the second. <laughs> oh, very funny. Very funny. <laughs> but Barry Sanders could just make you look oh, yeah. God, ridiculously bad. Um, so speaking of uh, making someone look ridiculously bad, who was the most difficult guy to tackle? Well, hmm. That's kind of a tough one. You know, I, I think more in terms of the pleasure it was tackling something like, I actually tackled O.J. Simpson. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he was at the end of his career, and I know it's a bad, you know, oh, my God. But uh, you know, it, it, a lot of times it was just kind of an honor. I mean, Calvin Hill went to <laughs> Yale, and I hit him on a short little third down pass against Cleveland. It was shook my, I, I introduced myself, shook my, his hand. And my defensive teammates are going, what was that all about? Oh, he went to Yale. Oh, you guys, you know, Ivy League. But, you know, I, you know, you look at different styles. Like Tony Dorsett was not a really big running back, but he was phenomenal and breaking off tackle. I mean, just incredible speed and, and movement. But, you know, my rookie year, I was drafted by Miami Dolphins and ruptured my lung. I was playing with Mercury Morris. <laughs> you know, and I mean, I'm I'm just like you guys. I'm a fan, and all of a sudden, I'm on the NFL fields, and I just, you know, you just feel so lucky to be there. Well, um, I'm lucky to uh, have been given the opportunity to moderate this discussion. Uh, Mike, thank you very much for having me. Gary, thank you very much for 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 joining us. Um, whether you are on the field or off the field, innovation is all around us, but. We also have a, a raffle winner to announce. That uh, winner is Ronan Belkind. Congratulations, Ronan. You are the winner of the Jersey raffle. Um, so thanks to our viewers and uh, for tuning in and for participating in this discussion. I, was, I thoroughly enjoyed myself. I, I'm sure that, um, that Mike and Gary did as well. Um, you can check out uh, Nova Financial Networks at anovanetworks.com, and you can check them out on social media, and you can check uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Fensick out just about anywhere um, the internet is served. Um, and so, guys, that's it. That, that's all the time that we have. Thanks again for, for letting me uh, moderate the discussion. And thank you to Anova for for making it all happen today. And Gary, Mike, thank you so much. Pleasure. Best of luck yeah. to everybody, and, and thank you. It was you, great. Uh, you, I had a I had a blast. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you. Bye bye.